Um, I'd like to say thank you very much uh, for the invitation to, to come and speak today. It's an incredible honour to be here and a, a great pleasure as well. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to meet you and I hope to an extent that this will be, this will be mutual. Um, what I teach mostly at the Univers University of East London uh, is international relations theory, but uh, I thought it might actually be a bit more interesting to, to talk about China today. Um, and actually, I can, uh, it's really nice to see so many people that are interested in learning about China, actually. Um, and uh, I, uh, I think it's important for you, actually. I think it's in your interest to find out more about China. So, you know, hopefully this, this kind of short talk will, will push you in the right direction. Um, I can remember very clearly uh, when I started to become interested in China. Um, and it was a, I was about the age that you are now, um, if you can imagine that you know, long ago in the past. Um, I grew up in the, in the 1960s and there was lots of talk in, in the media about the Cultural Revolution in China, which I thought was incredibly <coughs> fascinating. And then I remember a very particular day in 1974 when I heard news about the discovery of the, the Terracotta Warriors. Um, and I always thought after that I'd be really, really interested to, to go to China. So my, my interest in the country dates back 40 years. Um, and I'm very fortunate to be able to, to teach a course actually on uh, China at the University of East London as well as teaching theory. Um, the question that I thought I'd talk about today is the question you can see on the PowerPoint. Um, and the question, when will China rule the world? Now that question is partially a response to the book by Martin Jake, uh, which went under the title When China Rules the World, The End of the Western World and the Birth of a New World Order. But I also thought it was kind of an interesting question in itself, because uh, you know, when I, when, in the days when I used to sit exams rather than uh, take exams, this, this was the kind of question that would have attracted me, because it's sort of full of amb ambiguities and it's full of assumptions. So there's an underlying assumption there, both in that question and in Martin Sheik's book, that China will rule the world, um, which I think is you know, something that we might have a debate about. There's also a question about um, what we mean by rule. What would it actually mean to rule the world? Has, has any country ruled the world so far, perhaps? I don't know. Um, so an initial answer to the question I guess, would be, uh, when, when will China rule the world? Well, it depends on what you mean by rule, which, of course, is the sort of not particularly helpful answer that academics tend to give. Um, and I hope that I can do a little bit better than that in terms of providing an answer towards the end of the, the lecture. Let's do a bit of background stuff first. I'll do, do some easy things. Um, first of all, where is China? Can anybody tell me where China is? Asia. Uh, so if you went out the front of the building, I think turn right, uh, walked for about 3,500 miles, you would get to the top northwest tip of China. Uh, if you went on for another 1,500 miles, you'd get to Beijing. Um, so one thing about China is it's incredibly large. Um, can anybody tell me how many borders China has? Anybody make a guess? Six. Fifty. Fifty? Fifty? Fifty. Was, it, was that fifty or...? No. You're not going to answer me again, okay? <laughs> it's, it's not fifty, all right? But something that sounds like that might be nearly right. Anybody? Five, five, not five or six. Up? Fifty. 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 Right. Fourteen, actually. Fourteen. Uh, right, let's see. So, they would be North Korea, Russia, Mon Mongolia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Nepal, Bhutan, uh, Myanmar, otherwise known as Burma, uh, Laos, Vietnam. Uh, also, China is in very close to uh, Taiwan, South Korea and Japan. Um, it's the third largest country in the world. Does anybody, can anybody say who the uh, first two largest countries are? Russia. Russia, really good. 
Canada, excellent, well done. Okay, something else that's really large about China. The population. Population, yeah, okay. It's got the largest population of uh, any country in the world. Uh, roughly one in five people in the world are, are Chinese. Uh, India's got a population of 1.2 billion. Uh, so behind that, just as kind of comparison, US around about 316 million. Um, some other kind of basic stuff about China. I mean, one thing that I try, you know, in terms of my teaching about China, is to try and kind of break down the idea that it is some kind of monolithic country. It's a country of incredible contrasts. Um, and uh, there's, there's two kind of divisions between east and west and north and south. And actually a large proportion of the country is relatively unpopulated. So up, right, so I'm going to try and use the, the pointer here, okay. Up here in the northwest is a kind of largely desert area. Down here in the southwest, uh, largely mountainous. Over here to the east, the, the, the plains, this is where the bulk of the population live. Around about uh, 90 to 95% of the Chinese population live in this eastern area. So there's, there's quite a split between east and west. And uh, one of the significant splits between east and west, uh, as well as the population, the further you go to the east, the greater the tendency for incomes to be higher. So incomes of people living in the West tend to be relatively lower. Incomes of the people in the East tend to be largely higher. This is because of the extent to which industrialization has occurred uh, over the last 20 to 30 years in this region. There's also a split between North and South. Uh, the North is relatively temperate and more like a kind of European climate uh, with very hot in Beijing, uh, very hot summers, very cold winters. The south is largely tropical. Uh, and this is reflected uh, an extent, to an extent in terms of the agricultural production and the, and the food eating habits. The south is largely, largely rice bound, uh, largely uh, rice orientated in terms of uh, diet. The north, uh, largely uh, noodles and uh, wheat, wheat based diet. Um, and within China, there's a credible diversity of uh, uh, cuisine and very kind of experimental and adventurous kind of uh, eating habits. The set of people that live in Guangzhou down in the south, uh, for example, that they'll eat anything that flies that isn't a plane, anything on four legs that isn't a table, and anything that swims in the sea that isn't a submarine. So it's a really kind of uh, diverse uh, cuisine, if you can imagine that. Okay, um, I came here to talk about foreign policy, so let's talk a little bit about that. Um, and five things I think we need to take into account when we talk about uh, Chinese foreign policy. Um, now, China's often described as an emerging country or an emerging superpower. Um, by contrast, I would describe it as a re-emerging power, a re-emerging re superpower. Um, and the reason that I would say this is because through you know, the vast extent of written history, China's been at the leading edge economically, politically, and in particular, scientifically. It only started to fall behind relatively, compared to, to Europe, perhaps you know, through the uh, 18th and 19th century. Up until that point, it's certainly been at the forefront of scientific uh, endeavor and scientific advances. Um, the Elizabethan philosopher Francis Bacon, for example, talked about three inventions that changed the world. Anybody got any guess what they might be? <coughs> okay, Francis Bacon talked about these, these three inventions that had changed the world. They were gunpowder, printing, 
and the compass. And Bacon didn't know what the origin of these particular inventions were, but they were all Chinese. And many things, uh, many things in the agricultural sphere, many things in the uh, military sphere, actually we find being used in China hundreds of years before they were used in Europe. The crossbow, for example, was used in China at least a thousand years before uh, it was used uh, in Europe. And China was probably, by, by some accounts at least, the largest economy in the world way into the 19th century when it was overtaken by the British economy. So a lot of uh, global historians, a lot of world historians are starting to say now, actually, the, the last two or three hundred years has actually not been typical of global history. This kind of period that we see dominated by Europe, that we see dominated by the United States, this kind of thing that we call the West, this is perhaps the exception in terms of global history and not the norm. And what we're seeing with you know, the, the very, very rapid changes that are currently happening in China is a re-establishment of the norm not something kind of unique or particularly different. So I'd say the first point in terms of thinking about China is that it's actually a re-emerging power rather than a specifically an emerging one. Now the second thing I'd say in terms of significance with regard to Chinese foreign policy is something that the Chinese call the century of humiliation. Um, and this refers to the period roughly 1840 to about 1945. Now, this may seem a little bit like ancient history to us, but to the Chinese it's very significant and it's very important. This was a time when their country was virtually overrun by the European powers. And at the forefront of that period, this period we might call European imperialism, were the British. The British went to war twice with the Chinese through the 19th century, the, the so-called Opium Wars. The first one in 1839, the second one in 1856. And these were wars that were launched by the British uh, to enforce the sale of opium into the country, which the Chinese were trying to ban. It was all, they were also wars to open up China for free trade and to get various other concessions that the, the, the British and the other European powers wanted. By the end of the 19th century, the country of China had virtually been broken up into a number of spheres of influence, largely under the control of, of the European powers. <coughs> and China was subject to a series of what the Chinese call unequal treaties. Unequal in the sense of they were on the kind of losing side and the Europeans were on the, on the gaining side of it. Um, and all Chinese children now learn about this kind of century of humiliation. It's something that they are made very well aware of. And in some ways it drives, drives Chinese foreign policy in a couple of ways. Partially because the Chinese are very you know, uh, certain that they do not want this kind of situation to occur in the future. They do not want their country to be dominated by the Europeans in the way that it was in the 19th century. But also, with regard to their views about intervention, the Chinese are very reluctant to sanction intervention in other countries by the United Nations. So, for example, I'm sure you've heard on the news, you know, lots of talk about the situation in Syria and the desire of some, some countries to intervene in that conflict. China has been at the forefront within the United Nations of trying to block possible interventions uh, within uh, Syria. Okay, so the century of humiliation is something that Chinese leaders are very you know, sure that they do not want to occur again. Um, after the century of humiliation, which I suppose we could say ended around about 1945, the end of the Second World War, um, China underwent a major civil war. Uh, and the outcome of that civil war was that the Communist Party uh, became uh, the ruling party in China. 1949, Mao Zedong declares the foundation of the People's Republic of China, 
and he says China has stood up in a way a reaction to that, you know, the century of humiliation. That was all in the past now. China is going to stand tall and kind of make its way in the world. Um, now, part of the, uh, the foreign policy, you know, part of the, um, the, the guidance, I suppose, in terms of foreign policy, emerged in something that the Chinese called peaceful coexistence. And the term peaceful coexistence was first used with regard to Chinese relations with India. Um, but it has become a much more broader kind of uh, set of guidelines in terms of its dealings uh, with the world. Now, the Chinese quite often like to do things with regard to numbers, and there's five principles of peaceful coexistence. Um, and to be honest, I don't think they needed five. I think two could possibly, <coughs> maybe three. But the, the five principles are mutual respect for sovereignty, which, you, again, you know, you can kind of think back to what has happened in the century of humiliation, a kind of respect for other countries' sovereignty, that they would not intervene in other countries or would not challenge the borders of other countries. Um, mutual non-aggression, not using uh, military tactics in terms of uh, their foreign policy towards other countries. Non-interference in domestic affairs. In a way, that seems to me kind of very similar to uh, respecting other countries' sovereignty. Um, not interfering. So, for example, you know, Syria, again, would be an example there. Not interfering in what's going on, in what is, you know, as far as the Chinese are concerned, an internal matter. Um, equality and mutual benefit, okay, ensuring that all relations between countries uh, respect the kind of notion that all states are quality, uh, are equal, and that all states should benefit from all forms of cooperation. And finally, to kind of sum it up, peaceful coexistence, which in a way kind of puts all these together. The important thing in terms of these sets of guidelines were that states should, ex should coexist uh, without using military means. They should exist uh, in peace. Okay, um, I mean, China hasn't always respected those. Uh, China, for example, invaded uh, Vietnam in 1979. This was not where kind of uh, that, that notion of mutual non-aggression was respected. Um, Another element in terms of uh, China's foreign policy, or another kind of sense, set of guidelines alongside peaceful coexistence, would be uh, what's been called Deng, Xiao, Deng Xiaoping's 24 character strategy. Hey, anybody know, anybody know who Deng Xiaoping was? He was leader of China. Leader of China, yeah, excellent. Uh, after Mao Zedong, essentially. Uh, Deng Xiaoping was the, the, the main leader following on from Mao Zedong. And in some ways, I think perhaps one of the most you know, um, significant characters of the 20th century. Uh, and in fact, much of the way, you know, things that have developed in China and its impact on the world kind of boils down to Deng's influence. Um, and Deng left some guidelines for how foreign policy should be conducted. And it's called the 24 character strategy because it could be summed up in 24 Chinese characters. And to, to give you what the, the strategy is, Deng, Deng's advice in terms of foreign policy was to observe calmly, secure our position, cope with affairs calmly, hide our capacities, <coughs> Bide our time. Be good at maintaining a low profile. And never claim leadership. So underlying that, there's the, you know, taking to a certain back seat in terms of international politics. Kind of hiding capacity. Never claiming leadership. In a way, not appearing to be a threat to other states in the world. And that's also reflected in the, the final point that I'd like to make about final uh, foreign policy, which is this notion of peaceful rise, or sometimes peaceful development. 
Now, through the 1990s, as people became, started to become aware of the changes in China, there emerged in the United States a kind of body of literature which we could kind of label China threat theory. And the Chinese were well aware of this. And obviously, you know, from Deng's words, he, he was a kind of sufficiently uh, wise observer of international politics to be aware that China's rise wouldn't go unobserved. Uh, and as I say, this kind of China threat theory started to emerge in the United States with kind of concerns about you know, the things that were happening in China. What were they going to be the implications for the United States? Um, at the start of the 1990s, there was a kind of huge literature on a kind of Japan threat with the kind of notion that Japan was going to be the next challenger to the United States. But by around about 2000, that Japan had been replaced by China. And the Chinese, in a way, were attempting to play this down. And one of the things they did was kind of come up with this notion of peaceful rise, that their rise would be one that would not be a threat to other states, that would not be a threat in particular to the United States. Now, they started to find the term rise also, could, in, it was, in some ways, could be threatening, even if, that was peace, even if that was peaceful. So they started using the term peaceful development. Okay, that China was growing and developing, but it was going to ensure that this was going to be in a peaceful way, to not appear threatening uh, to other states. Okay, so, what perhaps might it mean to rule the world? Now, as I said at the beginning, you know, no one state has, has ruled the world in the sense of it's kind of become the central government, it's dictated everything that's happened in the world everywhere. Um, you've, we've had empires, the European empires, um, where there have been you know, direct control of territories over the world, but none of those have encompassed the whole world. After the Second World War, we see the United States emerging as a major power in terms of international politics. Maybe this is the closest that any country has got to ruling the world in terms of the influence that it has uh, been able to exercise over the rest of the world. So maybe we can use some things in terms of kind of thinking about the, the role of the United States uh, globally to think about how China might end up ruling the world. And of course one element of that is when it becomes the largest economic power. And China's been growing at a phenomenal rate since Deng Xiaoping became the, the paramount leader in 1979. It's been growing kind of off and on, around about 10% a year. A phenomenal rate of growth. Uh, David Cameron will be incredibly happy if we had a third of that growth in this country. But that's been happening year on year, virtually since 1979. It's tailed off a little bit since 2008. I think it's now around about 6 or 7%. But it's a huge rate of growth. And by some uh, estimates, of course, there's different ways of actually counting the kind of size of different countries. But by some estimates, China will become the largest economy by 2016. So if our criteria is, uh, in terms of you know, when China will rule the world, if our criteria is when it has the largest economy, then China will rule the world in 2016 by these, by these estimates. Okay, another estimate that we, we might use is when China has <coughs> the largest military power. Again, of course, there's different ways of measuring this. Um, if we measure it by how many people there are in the Chinese military, then China already rules the world. Um, I think the figure on the, 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 the presentation that was at the front was around about three and a half million people in the Chinese military, um, which is far larger than any other country in the world. So by that criteria, China maybe already rules the world. Um, but that's only one measure, in a sense. In terms of its technological capabilities, China, in, in, in military terms, China still lags quite a long way behind the United States. And the United States spending on the military is several times larger than that of, uh, of, of, of China. 
Um, one of the problems in terms of these kind of comparisons actually is the figures of, for China are, are very hard to get hold of. But um, we might say that, well, China's probably the second largest, China has the second largest expenditure on the military in the world. Um, and that's probably very roughly around about half of what the United States spends. A third way that we might say, you know, a country rules the world is that it sets the rules for, for international politics. Now, after the Second World War, a number of international institutions were created. And was, these were primarily created by the United States and reflect US interests to a greater or lesser extent. Things like the United Nations, the uh, International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, all created primarily by the United States. And these organizations, we, we could include the World Trade Organization as well, set the rules, in a sense, for how trade is undertaken, for how global finance works. China, so far, has not challenged these organizations itself, but it has become involved in another set of all, in another organization called the BRICS. Has anybody heard of the BRICS? No? Okay, I mean, this is a very loose grouping of countries. Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And the BRICS meet on a fairly regular basis. And they're starting to move towards creating uh, an institution. Um, now, there's all sorts of differences between these countries and probably different sets of interests, but to some extent, this kind of grouping could potentially provide a, a challenge to those organisations that uh, have been set up by the United States and perhaps could be seen as representing uh, Western and European uh, interests. But once China starts, in a sense, starts challenging and setting the rules in the way that the United States was able to do post-1945, then I think we can truly say it started to, to rule the world. 